All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's time to get started. Uh, my name is Christoph von Laarhoven. I think many of you already know me. Um, and this semester, we're going to start with a new course called Advanced Programming in C++, which started because I am doing another course uh, called Introduction into Programming in C++, which I need to keep uh, simple because there are a few people that uh, have almost never programmed and that need to follow this course as well. And here, I hope to be doing the opposite. I can finally go into the more in-depth uh, topics. Um, I think there's loads, or there's a, a big variety of students also here. Some of them, uh, of you I know from mechatronics. Some of you I know from computer science. Is there anyone else from another study program? So it's just computer, star, uh, computer science or mechatronics? Mathematics, oh, interesting, excellent. Yes, welcome. Um, so we're going to see advanced programming in C++ uh, a whole semester long. And those of you who know me from the other course uh, kind of expect or can expect uh, already what is going to happen and during this course. Um, others will be in for perhaps a surprise. Um, the contents are not entirely set in stone yet. This is what I definitely will see because those, I think, are the fundamentals of C++. And about two-thirds of that I've already seen in my other course. So those of you who um, followed that one, you might think, you know, what um, uh, would I uh, gain by following this course? Well, I'm going to revisit even the beginning uh, the similar contents, and today especially I think you will see lots of things returning so that everyone can follow. But I will do this in a very fast tempo so that everybody who is already aware of C and C++ somehow, or Java or a very similar type of programming language, can pick up. And that I don't lose too many people because it gets too boring, but I don't lose too many people because it is um, too new. So I try to um, follow the middle road there. So that is more or less my, my uh, hope that I will get uh, through the seven first weeks in all of these and then I can start um, going into suggestions and also there I would also hope that you give me input of, on what you want to see. So one of the things we'll definitely see apart from these um, are design patterns. I think design patterns are very nice, but I don't know really how to show you this in a lecture. <laughs> Um, and that's something I'm still battling with. If you have a good idea there, let me know. If you have a nice design pattern that you would really like to have explained, um, let me know as well. So we're definitely into your input here, and I look forward to exactly that. So we'll see whether this will actually be attainable, if I can actually go through all of this uh, in these seven weeks. Uh, it's a very typical course for uh, University of Siegen, so it's basically two hours of lecturing where I basically show you slides. Uh, but those who know me from Introduction to Programming, so the course over here, uh, know that during the lectures as well I try to program and keep things interactive. Um, during the lab, which is following from next week onwards after the lecture in exactly the same room, we're doing uh, programming tasks. And then I assume that you're, this won't be enough, the lab course, uh, the lab session for two hours. So I'm assuming that you will need at least two hours per week at, in addition to solve assignments at home. And this I showed, I think, last semester as well to the students of Introduction to Programming in C++. That is only the tip of the iceberg. We've only seen the very core of C++. We stopped at polymorphism, uh, but I didn't see um, very very interesting things, like a copy constructor, for instance. Um, and that's, that, those are the things we're seeing in this course. Um, so even though today you will see lots of things repeated, for those who follow the top course, um, I think it will soon start to get looking completely different. Uh, I do have a Moodle page, which is very minimal, as you probably have seen already. It just says where this course is uh, taking place. And over there, I'm going to just have the assignments. So you will have assignments every other week and the assignments are in class on paper. Only that way I know whether you can program or not. Um, so I will uh, ask you then to come here in presence every other week and the next one will be next week already. 
and uh, during the first part of the uh, exercise class, each of you is getting uh, an assignment. It will be different from the ones from your neighbors, and you get quite some time to solve this assignment. In the beginning, of course, it's going to be a very simple assignment, but these things will get very exciting very soon. And those are then marked. That's the, basically the in-class um, assignments that uh, are uh, the exercises that we base uh, ourselves upon. I think it's necessary or even uh, encouraged because that way um, everyone is disciplined enough to already after week three or week four stick with uh, the schedule. And, and that's necessary because also here, since I'm going quite fast probably, uh, it's very easy to miss a few things. Um, and again here, I'm going to do the same as in the other course. I'm going to try to program a lot during even the lectures. I'm going to go and skip quite a lot of theoretical parts. I'll drop, uh, or I'll try to use a few words here and there, but it's really about the practicing, not about um, knowing uh, high-level concepts that don't bring you anything when you're actually programming. Another thing that I will do much quicker here is introduce new tools. You will see that in a second, um, that I hope you're able to deal with from the start. Right? So that's, that's another thing that um, I think is, is definitely necessary um, if you follow a course and if at the end of the course um, um, I can call you advanced in C++. Right? That's, that's the hope. Right, and this course material was inspired by several people, uh, my colleagues Ron Wiesmuller and uh, Hannah Bast, um, uh, who I worked with earlier, um, um, are the ones that started uh, these elements and that I now have uh, in these slides as well. So credit goes, goes also to them. Um, and the grade, you probably have already seen this, is half from the exercises half from the exam. There will be a written, handwritten exam at the end of the semester, very similar to uh, what you see also in the exercise uh, sessions. It's also there. Um, that's the best way to see whether somebody can program, just if they get something on paper and then immediately can program without testing whether it compiles, um, without help from a compiler's error codes, etc. And the way this, this exam is uh, uh, executed, I think, is uh, also very classic. So it's only one hour, so we can't ask that much. Um, and it's only you, a piece of paper, and a pen, basically. All right. There's two, no, there's six more places here in the front. Yes, yeah, come over, don't worry. <clears throat> and I'll start very gently, as you can see. So. Um, C++ is a very old-fashioned language. So um, unlike other languages that you might have known or that you might already know, in C++ we try to be uh, able to describe an algorithm in a way so that a compiler can create an executable from this. And this is going into a comp compilation and then a binding and building step. So in C++ you have your program, which is a basically nothing else but a text file that you could create in any editor that you would like, and you compile it, and then afterwards you build it and execute it as, a, as an executable. I think this is hopefully nothing new. I mean, there are differences with, for instance, Java, who is like a, a virtual machine that you then um, uh, run things on. That's, that's for certain things quite nice. Um, some other programs like Python do, some, do something completely different. You don't have an executable. Um, but uh, C++ follows exactly this path as programming languages traditionally have done all the time. And this is um, the way it happened for a very long time. And a program is essentially a, a series of machine instructions that will, is already hopefully already clear. Um, but that is something that uh, would become really clear when you start thinking about uh, C and C++ programming because there the memory footprint of everything is really, really important. And that's why, for instance, C++, um, everything has a type, which is very different from many other languages or some other languages. Uh, and that has lots of per uh, repercussions, but also lots of advantages. Um, C++, I think, is a language for the control freaks who know exactly what is going on at what point in time and how many bytes something is taking. You know, that's really nice to know. Um, 
And we don't have uh, always things like garbage collection happening in the background that could mess up things um, or other things like a variable that is uh, changing its type. Right, and then um, when whenever we program, we create source codes, which is usually just a CPP file or a header file. Later we'll see also make files, of course, and many other um, helper uh, files that you will need. But whatever we're going to do in the first couple of weeks is usually encapsulated into either a .h file or a .cpp file, but those are text files. And those are text files that you need to give to the compiler, which then it's... Um, uh, transforms into an executable eventually, if everything goes right. Right. Um, what we're going to do in the course is follow loads of standard tools. I'm sure many of you already have this experience. Um, since it's a programming course, it's only natural that we will do most of the collection in a GitHub repository. So for that, you would need a GitHub account eventually if you want to then um, start working with that. Um, you don't need it uh, uh, dramatically, but I would advise you to do so. I think many of you probably already have. Who already has a GitHub account? Ah, okay, I would say 60, 70%, very good. Um, and, as a, and of course, I mean, there are many compilers that you could use here. There's many standard compilers. Um, one of the ones that, uh, I mean, we have to set one standard here, um, not in, uh, in C++, but in the compiler. And there I use the GNU compiler because I've been using it my entire life. I think that's the only reason. Um, there's, uh, I mean, you could go into religious battles there as well, I suppose, but I think it is just one uh, compiler where, which is very easy to get. It's free, it's open source. Um, and it's easy to get running on any type of system. So we will use uh, the GNU compiler. Unlike my other, uh, my introductory programming course where I force people to go onto my server and solve things there so we can see what is happening, here you're much freer, including also what uh, type of environment you're going to code in. Um, I would I would say it's probably easiest if you just go for a code-enabled editor. That's always the easier, not go uh, for a full-fledged IDE. But if you have this already, that's also, of course, not a problem. So here's a couple of examples. Um, I'm typically also uh, always using Z because it's very um, easy to use, on my system at least. Um, of course, if you're very hardcore, you could also go for Vim or Emacs uh, in a text uh, Comma on a text terminal, for instance, or NeoVim or Helix, um, but or many more. I'm sure that you have probably by now, or, or that many of you all probably by now already have an editor that they would like uh, to use. So, and if not, or if you want to try something else, I can recommend these. Uh, that's what I. What is definitely not suggested is that you open this in um, in a typical text editor which does not have any syntax highlighting, for instance or where it's a little bit harder to uh, indent your code, um, like Notepad or gedit. You could start like this, um, and I'm not going to force anyone, but I would not suggest it to, uh, as, as an editor. Okay, so normally my uh, programming, I mean, I also have a Java programming class, I have a, a C++ introductory programming class. I usually start with the birthday paradox, um, I'm not going to go into, or I'm not going to code this birthday paradox as I tend to do there. Um, if you did your bachelor's here as a computer scientist, or if you have followed the introductory course and you can see me doing this um, in YouTube, um, but it's basically already showing you that <clears throat> every program that you write is basically just text, right? And um, important, I think, as something that to, to get used to is that whenever you start programming, that you keep diligently uh, commenting your codes. Because uh, at most a week after you've stopped uh, or you finish this code, you yourself have forgotten what this code is doing typically. And therefore, it's always good to, uh, to comment the codes, including to, you know, add a header that says this is what I'm trying to do over here. Um, in uh, C++ or C, you will always have one function called the main function. 
um, which then returns an integer to the operating system, which then can be used as an error code. Um, and this can be then filled in to perform a certain function. So if you then afterwards, or if you have already seen this, you know that I'm, I'm uh, making uh, kind of like a quest uh, out of this. You know, what is the probability that, say, 35 people in a room, I mean, here there's probably more like 70 people in a room, um, have the same birthday, or two out of those 70 at least have the same birthday. Well, it's surprisingly high, the, the probability that two people here in this room have the same birthday, and this is how you can uh, code this. In the introductory courses, I also then uh, highlight this and compare it to uh, ChatGPT's answer, which is very, very different. Um, and I also show that this is typically done without too much testing the code and trying to run this via compiler. That's kind of the, what I hope to, uh, to already have set here. So, and, and if not, then we'll do this in a second anyway. <clears throat> so if you have the, Z, the GCC C++ compiler locally installed, and that is fairly easy, you just follow the link that was there two slides back, uh, then you can start compiling the code that you created into your text file, which is either a CPP file or a header file, .h file. Um, and uh, by doing so, you basically just uh, use the G++ commands in a text terminal, typically, um, and then you mention which file you want to have compiled. Easy. And then typically, if you do that and everything went well, an a.out executable is created. Um, and this you can immediately execute. Typically, when I will use this here, I use like a, a terminal. So you'll see me entering commands in a command line. I think that is nice because people can see where I am without, you know, a cursor going around, which is way too small. Um, and then you can see also what the effects are of a particular program. As an option for this command, you can use the minus O uh, uh, option and then create like a particular file uh, with a particular name. And then you can execute this file. You know, in uh, a graphical environment, you would double click that executable to execute it. In a command line, you just press enter after uh, mentioning the command and that's or the executable and that's it. And like that, you can uh, create your code step by step. There are loads of other things that we will see eventually. The fact that you can compile first and build later is something that we will do starting next week and then add make files in the mix. Um, and what we'll see also for this course specifically is lots of options. So C++ is not C++, you know, the typical thing that, um, that you not anymore really, but what you heard in the past is, oh, C++ does not have garbage collection and therefore is not so nice. Well, C++ does have garbage collection, it depends on which standard you're using. Um, so if you use standard 11 over here, then you can actually add that as an option in the compilation. If you don't, then you would get errors if you would use elements from this standard. And the standards go all the way up to, meanwhile, I think 26, I believe. Um, so there's loads of options and loads of bells and whistles that you can add. I'm not going to uh, uh, um, purvey here that I'm an expert in all of these. I'm probably using only a, a, a subset of the things that are available. Um, and that's probably also how everybody uses it, uh, unless you're really a, a C++ guru. Um, and in the committee, the standards committee of C++, I think most people can deal properly with um, just a few um, features here and there. But when you're compiling your code, therefore sometimes you might get errors just because you're using elements that are not part of the standard C++ uh, up to a particular standard, and then you have to mention this to the compiler. It's very important, we'll see this in a second um, in an example. Right, and um, I'm going to quickly go around this because this is uh, something that we will do uh, all the time. So obviously uh, the language itself needs lots of libraries. Some of them are standards, so they are already there. They were uh, there when you installed um, GCC, for instance. Uh, then you have these uh, smaller than, bigger than signs around your library after the include statements. Um, and sometimes you need to link them uh, explicitly because they're not standards. Like in this case, I have the ncurses library, 
um, that some of you still prob probably remember from the introductory course. Uh, in that case, you need to, when compiling, add the minus L here. Actually, I made here a mistake. This should be a space. Right. And you can also try out this code, by the way, um, or try out to see what happens uh, when you use that, co uh, that code. Um, but in this case, you would also need the NCurses library installed in your system, of course. All right. Um, another thing that is quite important, I think, and also here I'm going to be a lot, lot more relaxed than in the introductory course. I don't force you to, see, to use cpplint. I don't force you to use this two-space indentation. I just recommend it. Um, since most of your deliverables during the classes or at the exam are in handwriting, you know, I can't do this anyway. Um, but I do recommend it. So cpplint is basically a style checker for your code. And there you will see the hints on how code should be done. I mean, cpplint is uh, coming from Google. People within Google, when they're coding together in C++, need to make sure that they can read each other's code very quickly. And then it's easy to do it like this. You basically uh, style check your code so that everything looks similar. Um, it's a recommendation, not, um, uh, not a must, but it, it's always nice. And I think um, it allows us to also uh, spend less time in trying to figure out what a person is doing. If you're already indenting your code nicely um, uh, by default as you're coding. Okay, good. What are the basic components of a program? So when you write a program, you start writing this text file, uh, which um, has loads of different elements. So if you, um, if you write a program like this, for instance, you see already that uh, IOStream as a library is uh, included. That means we need things from this library. You have this main function. So as soon as you execute, eventually the executable that is produced from this, these are the um, um, statements that are going to be executed. And we're going to here, in this case, print out a couple of strings. That's what you see here. And there are loads of elements that are important here. Usually, when you're using one of those editors, they get different colors. So you can see, first of all, whether you typed correctly. But second of all, um, whether those are known keywords and uh, what uh, value then also your editor is attaching to those. These are the most basic keywords with which you can already do lots of things in C++. We will see about, um, about the same number uh, in this course on top of that. Right? Two already we will see today. Um, and um, these are a few, but um, basically only 33. So that's not much. If you consider C++ as a language, you know, I would immediately vote for a language where you have only 33 keywords. Um, but eventually, you will need to be able to use those keywords. And that is the most important part. Know the context in which those keywords make sense. So apart from the keywords, you have other things like, for instance, uh, preprocessor directives. Those are usually preceded by uh, this pound uh, symbol. And we will use, at the moment still, but later more not, uh, but at the moment still, uh, the include statements and the header guards. What those mean, we'll see later. So don't worry too much if this is um, all of a sudden too sudden. Uh, when I start talking about header guards, I will explain also why you need those. But um, the include thing we already saw. So if you want to include a library, which basically means you include functionality in C++, you need the um, pound symbol and then include. Um, you need, or you can actually create your own names for variables, for classes, for functions. Similar to Java, or very similar to Java with a few exceptions, is that in C++ almost everything works um, as long as it has letters, digits, and underscores. And you can start with an underscore or a letter, but you can't start with a digit. Um, and that means you, these are correct names, for instance, for a class or for a function or for an attribute or a variable that you will see. Uh, these are wrong because there are no empty spaces allowed, obviously. There's no minus allowed because that's an operator. Uh, there's no starting with a digit allowed because it's illegal. Um, and there's no um, reserved keywords allowed that you can just rename. That would be silly. Yeah? 
Uh, constants are very important because, as I said in C++, everything is typed. Everything has a particular type, and through this type, we know what we're dealing with. And I argue that that's something nice, um, but their opinions differ. But it also means if you have a constant, if you have a variable of a particular type, for instance, and you want to assign this to a constant, then you also need to be very transparent about what this constant is. And therefore, these constants have also particular ways of writing. That means if I have a floating point, which is a, a number with uh, some digits behind the point, right, like this one over here, then if this is a floating point, you add an F at the back. Or you can also not do this, but that will have a repercussion, because that suddenly will be a double. What that is, we'll see in a second. I bet most of you already know this. Um, but these are two different constants, right? An integer has also a particular thing. A character has a particular writing as a constant. A string has a particular way of uh, being visualized. And a Boolean as well, which is there true or false, right? Then you have operators. Those, for instance. You have braces, those, for instance. And separators, those, for instance. And we're going to just use them. I mean, I think I could uh, spend probably two weeks explaining the many different ways in the way, in the way these make sense. But I think also there I'm rather opting for things that are actually usable. Um, commenting you can do in uh, two different ways, or three different ways depending on your editors. But I mean, usually you have either a comment on the same line, then you do back uh, slash slash, and then write a comment, and then everything on the same line until the next line will be a comment. Um, or you can basically do this over multiple lines, or one line as well, uh, where you do uh, slash star, then you write your comment, and then you close it one or several lines later uh, with a star slash. Again, that is not, I think, too hard. You need to just be careful that you don't use uh, this closing statement somewhere in the middle of your comment, or then uh, the parser that would go over this would be um, confused afterwards. Um, and there's, I mean, this is of course also an art in its own, and also there you have styles in the way you write uh, your variables, or you, uh, you, you, you put your variables there, there's this camel case probably that you know, or you use underscores, etc., etc. We're going to also there be quite open to anything. Um, I use this myself, uh, so camel case most of the time, um, and this in uh, um, combination with a uh, with uh, comments is, I think, extremely important. Sometimes, or most of the times, you don't need comments if the names you choose for your functions, methods, attributes, variables, etc., is already clear. Um, but if you have screw max, you don't know whether really what, what this screw means. So then you would need to add that this is about a screen, for instance. And that max is a maximum, not a person. Yeah. So all of those things are then or tend to be really making your code a lot easier to read or a lot less uh, likely to be confusing for yourself and af others afterwards. <clears throat> Here's an example of one uh, piece of code. Um, so what I quickly go over what is happening here. So once you give this to C++ or your compiler, so GCC or C G++, then it will basically parse from top to bottom, left to right, and it will say, this is a comment, I don't worry about this. Um, here we have an include statement, so we have this IO stream library that we need to use. Then we start here with the main function, which is returning an integer, has no arguments in this case. And here we start with um, defining what this main function does. We create a character, which is a type of variable, um, um, which we call name, and actually we have 80 of those, which is an array, as you might uh, already know. Those are all just comments, so that is not really, uh, really used. Then we have this thing called std c out. Who knows what this is? Actually, not the mechatronics people because they know definitely, they should know what this is. Printing. That is a printing, yeah, a printing statement. What is this, this entity here? std is a namespace that I can already say, mm -hmm. but c out, what is that? The function that is uh, like responsible for printing out. Is it the function? Yes? No, it's more like a variable where we store the following part in. Yes, closer. Variable is a very good uh, denominator, but it's not really a variable. 
or we call this in C++ something slightly different. Uh, sir? We, yeah, we're using this as a stream, but Cout itself is an object. It's basically instantiation of a class. But don't worry about this. We're going to, as I already promised you, I'm not going to be too bothered by the right naming. Um, but in the end, this will become hard or will become more important that an object is not a class, totally different things. An object is not entirely a variable either, although the concepts are indeed very similar. Um, and like that, we will keep on going. Right, so C out is an object, and what that is, we will see in uh, three weeks. Um, but basically, um, you have this an object, and this object is using an operator. This is an operator over here, a constant string, etc., etc. Here is a character, a constant character, and I think I have most of the return. For instance, is a keyword. If is a keyword, that is uh, that we just saw in the table, etc. Okay. So we can link that and basically say every character, also the spaces that are in this text file, have a meaning. And uh, what we are doing, or what uh, um, the GNU compiler for us does, is read this and transform this into a, uh, an executable. That's for, for now everything you have to um, know, and I'm sure many of you knew this already. Variables are the most important part in programming in general because they, they represent what you're dealing with in terms of entities, in terms of memory uh, space. Um, and as I said in C++, variables, but also other uh, things, are always typed. Um, and in this case, uh, we have, for instance, a key press counter. We gave this name ourselves, right? That's, we could have called this anything. And this is a variable of the type integer. That's why it's preceded by int. And we can give this a value, like equals uh, zero. In this case here, we declare that we, from this point on, use the variable key press counter, and we tell also our compiler that this is an integer, like a whole number, and that we merely set this uh, variable to zero. That's called the declaration um, of, of the variable. In C++, you have to first declare a variable before you can use it. And that makes sense, I think. Um, and then afterwards, once you have that uh, variable, uh, you can actually do things with it. You can test whether the value of this variable at a later date, for instance, is bigger than 27. And if it is, or somewhere else in your code, you can also give it different values. Right? That's, that's, that is basically what a constant can be, uh, can be used for. Um, <clears throat> a variable can be declared as a constant, and also there, there is um, a lot of nitpicking whether a constant is a variable or not, but anyway, um, in C++, actually, the notation says that it is, right? So if you have, in this case, answer is yet another variable, it becomes a value, uh, value 20, uh, 42, it's also an integer, just like a uh, key press counter, but we put this um, const in front of it saying, it is something that looks like a variable, but it can't be changed. And in this case, trying to change this will result in an error, of course. So in that case, it's a constant as well. Just like those constants we saw in the previous slides, <coughs> that where we just use, or this constant over here is 27 is a constant, and it's a constant, an integer constant, because of its writing form. So just like that, answer is now a constant as well. And it has the value 42, right? And the variables, when you have them, when you create them in your program, they also have a certain space in which they are valid. And after a while, the variable might disappear from your memory. Um, and that's what we call scope. Also there, I could spend ages de uh, you know, defining scope. But I think also there, I think by using it, you probably will get uh, the best intuition about a scope. So for instance, if you have a function, like our main function, you can declare some variables, you can use those. As soon as that main function ends, all the variables that were used and declared in this uh, function are done. They're basically removed from memory. <coughs> These are some of the types that you can use. These are the integral types, so all of the different things that just um, have one particular value. And of course, there are loads of integer types. But characters are also integral types. Booleans are also integral types. Um, and that's about it. So basically, these are just four slightly different types that you might have. 
we will for now only see the basic ones, Boolean, character, integer, and that's it. Um, what we will see very soon, however, and that's what we're going to use a lot more, is in our programs, typically we want to explicitly say how big something is. And um, that is not always possible by looking at the native type. In that case, it makes a lot of sense to use one of these fixed width types. So that you can, for instance, say, I want an integer which is 32 bits long. Then you have integer underscore t as your type that you can take. And you could also say, because if you take this integer, then it's a signed integer. So it goes, if it's 32 bits, or I'm not entirely sure, it's, I think, minus 2 trillion or something, or, I don't know, billion? Billion, I think, to about 2 billion is the range that you have for a signed 32-bit integer. If you have an unsigned integer, then it goes from 0 to 4 billion, I think. Yes, I think so. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yes, but, but in uh, binary notation, that doesn't help me. Um, but something like that. I, I won't vouch for what I just said uh, in terms of the numbers, but I can see what the range of the values is that I can give to this particular type, right? So all of these things are possible. These are all keywords um, in, in our table. Actually, the long and short and unsigned, I think I did not even have, or signs. But they basically just uh, mean whether you can go from zero to a maximum or you shift this around zero. Why? This we'll see also um, uh, later. And that means also you know how many bytes are being taken then. And whether the values that you want to store in this particular variable of this type uh, actually fit. Sometimes they don't fit and then you have um, overflow or overruns. For floating points, floating points are always a little bit uh, more difficult. Also there, I won't go into the IEEE uh, standards and the different ways you can represent the mantis, for instance. I think if you come from computer science, you probably have already seen this in your bachelors, but it's not the most important thing. It just means that, um, that you might lose in precision or in scale. And that is the only thing that uh, you need to be aware of when using floating points. Um, and there we typically use float or double Double when you don't want to bother about uh, memory space. Float when you want, when you know that you have a very simple type of floating points. Um, and that's about it. And if you really want to go into um, compressing your memory as much as possible, you can actually go a little bit deeper into this via other types um, of, um, of via other types that are available but then only from a certain standard. So these, for instance, are possible. You can basically say how many bits your floating point um, uh, variable is. You can go from 16 to 32 to uh, 64 even. But in that case, you need to also mention to the compiler that we're using now, in this case, the 23 standard of C++. <clears throat> right. Um, and that's what I basically just said. A type de uh, describes three things, basically. It describes what values your variable can take. You know, if you have a character, it will take a character, like a question mark or an a, a letter A. Um, if it's a Boolean, it can only uh, take true or false. Um, not entirely true, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> and um, if, uh, if you have a certain type, then you can also uh, know how much memory is allocated. Sometimes you also need to know what type of compiler you have or what type of architecture you have fixed on your system um, for that. But I think in, uh, if you know which type to use, you typically can make sure that it's actually uh, there all the time, that this is fixed, that you know this. And if you know uh, what type of variable is, you also know what operations are valid for this variable. Some things you can divide, other things you can't. For instance, um, or divide by a number. I should have said that is a, a little bit too rough. Good. And then basically everything, uh, a lot of things, uh, including variables and constants, we'll see later also methods and functions, um, have a type. Um, and for constants, you can tell it by their form. So we saw a 12, that's an integer, or 2.3 is a double. Um, and those uh, basically are things you can use in your code straight away. 
constants are not a problem. You just need to know how to write them or how, what their notation is like. <clears throat> and for variables, you need to explicitly declare them. You need to say int i, and then you have an integer with the name i. Okay? In memory, I mean, this is a very simplistic way of how uh, this works. If I have here my main function, so in my executable in the end, I will create four variables of different types. I will give them a certain value, and then I return. So I don't really do anything, um, uh, anything useful in this case, but I will fill my memory and do something with the memory. And that is often what, uh, what you're doing in your program anyway. Right? So I can create a symbol, and if you looked at a, uh, and still memorized that table that you had in it, then a symbol or is a character typically, that's a type. Um, and this is usually fitting in a byte. Um, if you have an integer, then this is typically four bytes. Um, and that we call in this case my integer. A Boolean is also fitting in a byte. Strangely enough, not a bit. Um, and a floating uh, point, like not a double but a float, um, is fitting also in four bytes, which are differently arranged than the integer, so therefore you will see things differently whenever you put values in that. So if you change the value of the integer in this case to 12, then you will see if the binary 12 appearing there somewhere in the, the bit uh, depiction of uh, your memory. Uh, the floating points will be slightly different. There we set it to 12, but somehow we have a completely different uh, visualization here makes sense because the floating point is slowly, is slightly differently organized. How? We don't really care about that. What we want to know is what we can do with those and more or less what is possible with each of those variables. And then a symbol also has a particular notation. In fact, that's also the reason why a character can also get a value uh, because this is nothing more than a number. A number between 0 and 200 uh, 65, right? So um, that, that is based on 56, uh, sorry, and 56 not included. Oh, I need my coffee today. Um, so that is what, um, uh, what, what the range of values that you have. So a character, like a question mark, does have also a value, right? Or a space does have its value, it's 32, right? So that means you basically have variables that you can now create in your memory, and those have a different type. Right? That's what, you, what is really important here. Same for a Boolean. A Boolean can be true or false. And this is then depicted on the lower levels as something which, is, which has lots of zeros or nothing but zeros or has uh, lots of zeros with a one. And in that case, it's true. Um, and this, I mean, this is basically the, exactly the same slide that I have for my introductory course. And I would I urge you also to stick to very simplistic things if, they, if you, they're not demanded by the application. And then usually these standard types are all you need. And uh, the magical things in C++ are happening through the things you're building around those, your classes and your hierarchies in that case. Um, or what you take from, um, from already uh, available libraries. So one of the things that you obviously see here is missing is a string, right? We saw that there is a string that as, as a constant, but we don't see directly a string here because a string is basically nothing but an array of characters. That's the lower level explanation. Uh, but also there, it's easier then to in import or in, uh, include a, uh, a library that actually deals or gives you the string class and then deal with that, right? So these are the basic types that will probably solve most of your problems in 99% of the cases. And this is how um, your constants uh, look in that case, or what your constants will look like. And if you know those, you know already probably most of the things you need in C++. If you need any extras, then you can look at the reference work that is here and there also on the slides available. Um, like these here, for instance, which is basically about how these bits are ordered for those particular types. But you don't really need to know that if you're, when you're programming. In most cases, I would argue. Um, if you want to have more in terms of constants, for instance, then this is what you normally do. You have then prefixes or suffixes, typically, uh, for your constants. So if you have an unsigned int, you need to um, add, so at the end, a suffix, which is a, a u, a big or a small u. Or a long int, you can have your number, like 
12, but this, if this really needs to be a long int, then you add an L in that case at the end, etc. Right? So this is how you then would create your constants of that particular type that are a little bit more wide, so not just the floating points, not just the doubles, but then also long, long integers, etc. The same for uh, these newer types we saw earlier. Uh, when you want to really say, I want to uh, have uh, 64, uh, no, uh, yeah, 64 bit floating points, in that case, this is how you then create your constant. It's a little bit convoluted then, but that's the way it is. And it's the same when you want to in your code, especially uh, C++ is often used in embedded systems where uh, a binary representation might be useful. In that case, if you want to include a binary representation, so in this case we have um, a byte in this case, um, where we have uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, Right? Those are the, the, the bit sequence that, uh, consist our, uh, that out of which our byte consists. In that case, this 0b, in this case, is our prefix. And this is our constant. It is just like any other byte, uh, just a byte. You could also use the number here. We could also use a character here. But this is basically another way of creating a constant, which is a binary, um, uh, of binary type. The same for octal or hexadecimal, also that is sometimes useful for embedded systems. And uh, since standard 14, you can also have these apostrophes to nicely deal with larger numbers. Also, that is a possibility that you could use, which is nicer, I think, for, for readability, but that's about it. Right, so that is the, um, the way we deal with, uh, with variables and also constants, because also constants are then put into our memory. Um, and once we have those and we give those particular uh, values, um, then this is what happens. The impact of, of, the, of a particular value is huge. I mean, huge if we now look at uh, a byte level and then zoom in on this. Of course, nowadays, when we have terabytes or gigabytes, uh, in, our, um, in our storage uh, devices or RAM, um, we don't really care too much about a byte. You would think, but that's not entirely true because if you have a lot of, uh, of a certain something, like an array of something, uh, then the way you represent that something is quite important. You know, if you use a float or use a double, then one is only half the size of the other. And then if you have many of those, then you would have a difference of either one gigabyte or two gigabytes. And then, of course, the differences do make a difference. And if you then, for instance, have a grid or a three-dimensional cube of those different entities, like a grid could be a picture, a cube could be a movie, and in that case, it makes a lot of sense to first think about what your variable is, what type it is, right? So in this case, we have this number seven in multiple different ways you would like to think about the number seven. So as an integer, as a character, as a float, or as a double. And as you can see, the memory footprint of all of those is completely different. Right? The, very, the smallest one is as a character, because uh, that is uh, in, um, in a standard or in a particular standard uh, of C++ only one byte. But an integer float have four bytes. If you use a double, it's uh, eight bytes. And also the way these are represented uh, are also having an impact on top of that. But I think here it's really about uh, the footprint first. Okay, so what we know, and this is kind of to recap, you need to declare uh, variables first, um, and you can immediately uh, assign them a value which is slightly different from first declaring a value and then afterwards assigning them a value inside uh, the lower workings of C++. And this we most of the time call initialization. So we basically declare that we're using my symbol and initialize this to the ampersand, for instance. Or we declare that we're using a, a floating uh, point with the name height in meters, and we initialize this to 1.85. And that's, that's what you, wh how initialization works together with the declaration of, um, uh, of a variable. Now, if you don't do this, then typically we can't expect your uh, compiler to give this already a nice value that you would think is sensible. So if you say int my number, you might think that my number is now zero, but it not always is. It really depends on your compiler and there's um, 
and, and, and sometimes it's not a sensible value to have a zero. Right? So, so there um, you need to be careful and typically uh, most style guides say that if you can, you need to always initialize your variables straight away. And of course, since they are variables, you can late, later change those values. Right? And the nice thing is that you can do this in one go. So you can actually uh, initialize multiple or declare and initialize multiple variables of the same type in one go. So here we have a list of integers. They're called my num and your num. And we initialize them as three, respectively eight. Uh, eight right? So to keep things a bit shorter. Um, yeah, here we have a very, very simple, uh, so that every, everyone is still uh, up to speed. So we have basically a main function here. We create a variable called my symbol, which is a character. We, assign, we don't initialize it, but we do um, assign it a value, uh, the, the value a afterwards, which is a constant character. So all is fine. Then we output this to the terminal. Then we change this value of my symbol to a q, and then we output to the symbol as well. Right? That's, that's uh, a very, very simple program. Now, what we can do in C++ for later, uh, uh, in a later standard, so in uh, C++11, is um, postpone this uh, decision a little bit more. So we can actually say we have here a variable A, and we uh, say this is of type auto, which is not really a type. It means that we give C++ uh, the instruction make the most use of this. So in this case, a is two, uh, 1 plus 2. Both of them are integers, so therefore a is an integer. And then a is automatically put as an integer. And we can do this for a float. So 1 plus 2.0, this is a float, this is an integer. The combination of this, we'll see, uh, is um, a float, or sorry, a double. So a floating point, or a double in this case. So in this case, b becomes a double. Now, this is something that you can use everywhere. So also, for instance, in a uh, loop, which we still will see today. Um, and also later in, for instance, functions, the return type of a function and elsewhere, wherever you have types popping up. Right? So auto is then something where you can, if you don't know yourself really, for instance, but also there's other uses for this, um, you can basically say uh, we're using auto here. And we're not sticking directly to an unsigned 8-bit integer directly, for instance. OK, so this is actually handing over things to the compiler, really. And this can be done uh, through the program, where the compiler needs to see what is going on in the whole program itself. Right, I told you already about scope. So scope can usually be tracked by the curly braces in C++. And also there are style guides, or many style guides say that wherever you can use uh, curly braces, you should. Apart from the fact where you can always create a block by yourself. So any series of statements in your codes can be wrapped up with curly braces and you say, this is my block all of a sudden. So it doesn't need to come after an if statement or after a switch statement or whatever. You can also just create your own block with the curly braces. But everywhere else where you can use curly braces, you typically should. Because you never know whether there's more statements that need to be added later, and then at least you already typed your curly braces. And also for readability, it is nicer to just see things being indented and then wrapped around with curly braces. So wherever you have curly braces, you have a scope. That means if we create integers over here, those integers live inside the scope where you start with the curly braces over here and end with the curly braces over here. And also here the indentation shows where they end, but really that is not of the concern of the compiler. It basically just reads all the signs and then knows that this one is opening and then closing here, so this one must be closing here. Right? So it's not, the indentation is not like in Python necessary. <clears throat> right, so basically here A and B are integers with the values 3 and 1, and then suddenly we enter a new scope over here. We try to use here variable C, which is of course quite silly because we don't have at this point an integer c. We all have it over here, right? So over here it would be possible, this would work, but this line over here needs to be removed really. Now when we are over here, we close this scope or close this block, then it would be, again, as silly, 
to assign the value of C to the value of B, which is what we're doing here. Because B exists in the scope, that is not a problem. C, however, was created in this scope or in this block over here. As soon as we exited this block, then C was deleted by our compiler in memory automatically. Think of this uh, compiler or what happens afterwards in your executable as something that uh, is trying to be as tidy as possible. Whenever you don't need variables, they need to be kicked out because they only take memory space and you don't want that. Right? So in this case, C was kicked out, so this would not be possible. Whatever you can, what else you can do is basically reassign names to variables. So we already have A as an integer here. We can't then assign it to a double. Right? So we can't have the same variable with the same name, but with different type. I mean, afterwards, C++ would not be able to know which one is which. And therefore, this immediately leads to an error. Okay. You can convert um, types in many different ways. Typically, this is where people, or maybe I will eventually uh, show you a table. No, I don't. I, I, I typically show them people big tables uh, with how, what has priority over what. Um, and what is converted to what. Um, they can do this implicitly, and if you know the rules, you can do this, and that saves you braces. However, you can use braces wherever there is a, a grain of doubt, and that, I think, is probably the easiest thing. So, um, in this case, uh, with braces and uh, the, um, the type, like, for instance, over here, we have a number. This is an integer, but we want to convert this number to a double, we want to do this explicitly. We could do this implicitly, but we want to do this explicitly so that when you're reading this code, you know, sure, this is a floating point of type double, and I'm assigning this to an integer. This is normally quite silly, but in this case, it makes sense. So doing this explicitly is uh, showing everyone who's reading this code afterwards that this was meant to be. And therefore, I would urge you just to do this always explicitly. So implicit conversion of types is usually always leading to problems and misunderstandings. So therefore, I would not ask you to go for the tables, and, and that's sometimes what people tend to do, uh, learn by heart um, what can be converted into what, but what isn't being converted into what, and leads them to, to errors. It doesn't make sense, really, most of the time. Uh, usually, you should stick to the type. That's, I think, uh, rule number one. Rule number two, uh, if you do conversion, do it explicitly. And that, I think, is uh, getting you out of the woods most of the time. Yeah. <clears throat> Here's an example of code that um, is used to find the ASCII code for certain symbols, which is fun. You know, what is, this, what is the, the number or the ASCII code for a question mark, an ampersand, and a pound symbol? Those are just arbitrary numbers that somebody once decided upon between 0 and 255. Um, and you can find out by converting these explicitly to an integer. So you basically have those, four, those three um, characters. You have the question, an ampersand, and okay, hash or pound, doesn't matter, both of them same. Um, and then in our terminal, we're going to print out the numbers that are assigned to these uh, symbols. So the question mark will give you a number, um, Print ASCII code, yeah, the ASCII code, so the, that number in the ASCII, ASCII table. Same for the ampersand, same for the hash. This is a, kind of a silly homework. How can you write this in a more memory efficient way? That is easy, I think. You should immediately see that. It's not that hard. You need to think what is going on into memory when we do this. So raise your hand or say something, otherwise I'll start. Oh, yes. You. Uh, one thing I think it is, is uh, declare all the variables in one line, like in the list. But will that save memory? No. <laughs> it will be a factor code. Uh, perhaps. I mean, but, but, but there's, there's a much easier solution. Yes, in the back. Exactly. Yes. And of course, it's, it's not also not going to say that much. You know, instead of three bytes that we have in memory, we have only one byte. But we could just say my symbol over here, assign it to a question mark, then print out the codes, and do the same for uh, all the others as well. 
And with a for loop, you might make it a little bit more uh, more performant, but that's about it, you know, in, in this case. Yeah. So, um, but, but in the end, of course, it does not make a huge difference. Those two bytes are laughable, of course, nowadays on, on any uh, type of platform, including microcontrollers uh, or very, very small systems. Okay, so on we go. Um, to uh, statements, assignments, and this is what I still have to go through. But now we're getting uh, slowly more and more towards programming assignments, as you can see. And starting from next week, I will do a lot more programming in, uh, in, in the course as well. Actually, today I will probably also switch. Right, so um, variables are the program's data. That's the information or the memory that you have to your availability. Statements is what is being performed with this data. And in, in a way, everything that you see in a function, for instance, like in our main functions that we had already a couple of examples of, is a statement. So this is a statement, this is a statement, this is a statement, this is a statement, etc. So assignments, like this one over here, is a statement as well. And they just have a particular form, right? And although we didn't officially see those operators yet, I think most of you know more or less what is, what is happening. Uh, over here, right? So you multiply x by 7 and then divide that by 2, and that is the value that you then assign to y, right? So, and that itself is a statement or an assignment as well. Right, so that, those are the different things, and that means uh, for the simplest type of uh, statement, we need something that is uh, doing something with our variables, and that would be an operator. So there are loads of different operators, and also here, you don't need to learn this table by heart. You just, I think, need to show, uh, be shown a couple of examples. Most of those are for the very simple C++ course. A few of those we're going to see in you, like this one over here. Okay, um, arithmetic operators, I think, are very uh, are easy to explain. So if you have loads of variables, which we... Um, initialize or not, like on this line over here, then you could, for instance, add to like x plus y in this case, x is 5, nine is, uh, y is 9. In this case, this over here is being calculated, is being set to 14, and the value of 14 is then uh, being assigned to the variable width. Yeah. The same for decreasing the value of width, uh, no, of, uh, then assigning uh, to length the value of width minus 1. Um, x times y, x divided by y is another one. Um, this, however, is a very a tricky one for, I mean, it's in the same in uh, Java or in other languages. If we here have x is 5 and y is 9, right, they haven't been changed here, this will result in 0 because uh, you divide here by an integer. And integer division in C++ is really not producing a floating point, that would not make sense. If you have an integer and you divide by an integer, then you assume that you want an integer back, or C++ assumes that. In this case, we might not assume this. We want, we want perhaps something different, but in this case, it would be. Right? An integer division is basically um, dividing x by y and leaving out everything that's behind uh, the, the, the separator, the, the, the dot. Modulo is something that you might not know yet, but it's basically division and the, the remainder after the division, right? So um, that's something we will uh, uh, use a lot of the times as well because it has certain properties. Um, increasing a value, so if x is 5, then now suddenly x is 6. Uh, if y is 9, then now suddenly y is uh, 8. Um, or something else what you can do is you can assign to something, and that's something you assign as well in one chain. Very bad practice again, or very bad style, because it's usually very hard. Uh, but sometimes it does make sense, especially if it's just three things. So in this case, you assign the value of y to width, and then you assign that value to the length. And the underlying reason is that everything that you have here um, as a statement is returning something. So the width equals y is not an operation that's uh, would be immediately understandable as delivering you a value, but it does. So if you, if you have this over here, or this over here, in fact, this statement delivers you a value, namely the value that you were assigned to it. 
And this value is then also assigned to length, therefore. What you can also do is assign uh, variables uh, in, or yeah, assign variables a value, like here x becomes the value 2, or y is getting the value 5. And at the same time, you multiply those, and that value is then given to multiply. Again, very dirty programming, but it is possible. Again, because assigning the value 2 to x is then returning 2. And assigning uh, the value 5 to y is returning the 5. So you can do this. Um, yeah, some operators don't always exist for the particular types. So I said already a type dictates what operators you can use. So for instance, a modal operator does not exist for a float or a double. And like that, there are several examples of things you cannot do um, with particular types. So operators are always dependent on the type. Which is also why um, you have this division. So here in this case, this is explicitly again saying this division by an integer. So you have two integers in this case. Um, and since 7 divided by 3, um, um, you would get something like, or you would expect something like 2 points, blah, 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 something, something. You will get a 2 only because it's an integer division. So make sure you, that, that that is often a mistake that is made. And the reason for that is because this operator divided by is operating on integers and therefore returns an integer. Now, first example that we're going to see, actually this is example 0. Uh, let me quickly move this into a 0 as well. Um, which is, I, I call it difficulty level 1. Actually, I wanted to call it difficulty level 2, but anyway. Um, oh no, this is actually indeed uh, a very easy one. Uh, <coughs> I think I skipped something, just a second. Oh, no, it's coming later. <coughs> so um, we have two uh, integers, number one, number two. We need to test whether number one is a multiple of number two and put that in the result below. That is something that you can do, but it, I think it's rather easy. I will go on in the interest of time and do uh, an, uh, another example in a second. <coughs> All right. Um, logical operators um, are also, I think, fairly easy to understand. You need to just know how to read them. This is a logical operator, equals equals, and it's often confused with the one equals sign. Um, so this is the one, number one mistake. In fact, very famous mistakes were made like that, um, even in very professional code that was open source and that has been seen for decades by people, um, but never been noticed where somebody, instead of testing uh, um, uh, for um, whether a div, uh, something is similar or the same, uh, they assigned it a value. And that was a, a mistake, and that you know, uh, perpetuated into many, many other things. So in this case, this between the braces will return true because f1 is the same as f1. This, in this case, will return false because these two are different. So exclamation mark equal sign is we want to test if those two are equal, and if not, <coughs> then we want to return that. So basically, in this case, we want to test if they're not equal, so it will get true, like a 1. Um, if that is the case, if that is not the case, we get a false back. Same like this one, there's also like um, uh, um, to, to see whether those two are the same. This is whether f1 is smaller than f2. This is whether f1 is smaller or equal than f2. And then you can, of course, chain things together. You can say if f1 is bigger than f f1, and if b1 is not true, then we do. Then you have basically this being a true or a false statement, right? And then you will get true or you get false back. This is an or, and this is an and. So I hope you know you had uh, your, you remember from your logical uh, classes. What happens when we have then, for instance, false and true, or false or true, and what that uh, returns. What we have also is this tertiary open operator, which belongs again to this family. So in the front of this question mark, you have your test. If f1 is bigger than 10, then this is either true or false. If it's true, we do this, and we return this. If it's false, we return this. And it actually is what this thing is returning, what our uh, uh, statement is, is returning. So in this case, this 
um, uh, is the case. So y is being returned to our terminal over here. Now for all those booleans that you have here, true and false, um, our output is not true or false because this operator has been uh, trained to give them the number rather than the true or false. If you copy-paste this into your own code and then uh, compile and execute this, you will see that you get a 0 or a 1, 0 for false, 1 for true, but I think that should not be too much of a, of a surprise. Then you have assignment operators. These are again just tricks to, uh, or this, uh, the assignment operator is just this one, but then you have ways to shortcut things so that things get shorter. So this over here is the same as y equals x minus, uh, e y equals y minus x, what is over here, for instance, and so on for the others. So in this case, z equals z modulo 3 over here. Okay? And z in this case is an integer, and that needed to be the case because if it was a float or a double, I would not be able to create uh, or to use the modulo operator. <clears throat> um, this uh, is a new one that I think um, many of you don't know yet. Who knows the spaceship operator? Very good, so I'm telling you something new. Um, it's called the spaceship operator because it looks a little bit like a UFO. There are very old-fashioned games that actually have a UFO that looks like this. Um, and it's only available from uh, uh, standard 20 onwards, so you have to then explicitly again say uh, standard 20 needs to be used when you compile this type of codes and it returns an object which we don't know officially yet but that will come uh, that uh, compares two things and then returns three types of things either um, something negative something positive or zero depending on whether it is smaller or bigger or comes before because it could be an object and can then smaller or bigger is not always the right term, but it comes before, for instance, if you want to sort particular objects. Um, and so basically, in, in, 3 is smaller than 5, so therefore this over here would return uh, the negative, a, ne a negative integer. However, and that's something we will see later, you can only, in this case, you can try this out at home as well, you can only try, uh, you can not, for instance, output this, then you will get strange errors that you're not using the right type. You can, however, uh, use them with uh, this operator to see whether they are zero or whether they are negative or whether they are positive. Actually, you could also do positive like bigger than zero. And in that case, you would get from this whole construction a true or false. So since three is smaller or comes before five, you get, you, you, it would be false to have something that is uh, equal to zero or that is bigger to zero, but it would get true if it was smaller than zero. Or in this case, we have the same symbol on both sides, the same character. So in this case, this is true, right? So this is the, the zero that is returned. In this case, this is true as well, because three becomes, comes before seven. So in this case, this is indeed negative. In this case, seven is bigger than five, so this is false. You would have to have a bigger than zero here to get a true out of that, okay? It's a little bit tricky, but especially when later for sorting, this is a really amazing operator to use. Especially when we sort objects that can be quite complex later on. For instance, okay? So here I want to have my example 0, 0, that's why. Um, and it's already two uh, peppers difficulty level because it will first give you the first um, insights in how complex uh, certain things can be. So this is testing three things, whether you can compile things. Um, now, first of all, whether you can understand what is happening here. Second thing is whether you can compile this correctly with the right, uh, with the right options for the compiler. And the third one is whether you understood the spaceship operator in this example. So this is something that you need to uh, do by next week. I will not help you here unless you really can't figure it out and just send me an email but uh, try it out. Um, I have this also already as uh, example 00 for t this week's uh, exercise session. So also there, this would be your first tests and your first dip in the water for programming in C++. So as you can see, we're using the 
rather new auto keywords and a rather new uh, operator, which we call the spaceship operator. Okay, so try it out at home and then see how this works. Um, for operators, you also have a, a, um, a priority. So some operators are more important than others and therefore those are executed first. So it's not always that you, everything is executed from right to left. Sometimes it's also from left to right or somewhere in the middle. And it depends on the operator itself. Again here, my advice would be to just forget about this and always use braces. Just like with the explicit conversion, use braces. Braces don't take that much space and they're much more explicit of what you want to do. Um, here are a couple of examples if you would not use braces and if you, you would. Um, so this is basically, um, I think, a lot easier. Um, one thing that has always, I mean, it's a little bit um, uh, artificial, but I would also never, or be you always very uh, thoughtful about the fact that if you use a prefix or a postfix increment or also decrement it's exactly the same different things happen because of the priority of operators again if you don't need the prefix operator never use the prefix operator I would say that is probably the easiest um, so in this case when, it, when a is 10 and you have the prefix operator that increments uh, the variable a at the end a will have been incremented um, uh, and B will have been incremented, or we, B will have get uh, the value of that incremented A, right? So first we uh, uh, use this operator, and then we use this operator. You know, first we, we use the prefix operator, then we use uh, this equal sign, so the assignment operator. Whereas here, we first assign the value of A, and only then increment A, which is a little bit tricky but that's the way it is because this incremental operator when in a, when it's a postfix uh, notation has um, a lower priority so the assignment comes first and then the incrementation comes which is the other way around and therefore we have this difference uh, this different sequence right again style guides say usually say that you should only do one thing right and, and not um, not bother too much about, uh, about looking at um, the priorities. Uh, blocks, I already kind of said, right? So you can basically have a block in anywhere in your code, and we already had a couple of examples like that. Um, and you should know where what is used. So if you use, in this case, for instance, the variable surf, then you can't use this later, even not even in a return statement of this particular a main function because surf over here was deleted as soon as this block ended. Right? That, that is uh, the point over here. What is happening in this block is actually kept, right? So it's not that um, all of that, all what is done over here in this block loses its value once you, once you exit this block. Right? That is quite important to know as well. When you leave a block, the only thing that is happening is that the variables that have been uh, created in this block are removed. Good, okay. Now, we're doing well. Half an hour left for if, switch, and the loops. So I will do this also rather quickly. Um, so if statement, I think, is also, if you know programming, something that you have already seen, this is the way to do it um, in C++. And here I'm, I've been naughty, I've not been using curly braces, even though earlier I said it's usually good practice. Um, so normally, even after an if statement, um, or after an if, you have only one statement to do, if this is true over here, I would use still curly braces, so that afterwards you can just add things easier. So in this case, if the number is smaller than zero, so if it is negative, then the sign uh, gets the value minus. And you can also use the else statement, as you probably already know as well. So if then uh, that is not the case, so if the number is equal to zero, or if it is positive, then the sign becomes a plus, right? That is, I think, quite easy. Here are a couple of examples of what uh, can be done. And between the braces, all you need, or what you expect there, between the braces in an if statement, is a Boolean. So a true or a false statement. Again, I could go into the entire semantics of what is expected here, but I think it's also here a lot more important to just use it. So whatever you have here as examples, 
um, um, uh, after the if statement is something that you can evaluate and that results in either a true or a false. Um, here, this uh, is the tertiary operator that I just explained, right? This is sometimes easier to do because in this case, this could be a function where we look whether one thing is smaller than the other. If x is smaller than y, then else we do something else. Well, in that case, this tertiary, op uh, tertiary, tertiary operator can be uh, one-liner, right? So that is why this operator is so nifty and cool, because if you understand what is happening here, you can immediately uh, compress code into a smaller uh, amount of characters, right? So this is a similar thing to this over here in the comments. Um, there are often uh, logical operators that you need, uh, and that's how you can create shortcuts in your if statements. So if read flag and write flag are booleans, oh dear, bool, bools, right? That was a bit of Java creeping in. Um, then th in that case, those two are either true or false. And then with the or operator, you get a new true or false out of this. Um, and then that's basically a logical or operator. Same like that, you can have a logical and operator. Um, and you can also have the logical not operator on top of that. Also here, um, leaving out the braces would be something completely different, for instance. So that's why braces tend to be always kind of helpful. And you can never have enough braces, I think, um, unless you're programming in Lisp or some other type of programming language that uses them way too much. Okay. You have to be careful with nesting if statements, and I think most of you know this already from other programming languages or C++. Um, you can alternatively use this uh, operator, of course, so that it becomes a lot easier. Uh, but typically, what we want to do is always use curly braces. I keep on repeating myself, I'm sorry, but it's really useful. Especially here, um, where the indentation is uh, correct, but if the indentation is somehow messed up sometimes, you can create problems um, if you don't use them curly braces, okay? That I think is something very simple. We can also use um, a switch statement. So instead of saying if this is true or false, then do that. Else if this is true or false, then do that. Else if this is true or false, or that is true or false, do that. We can actually create here a hierarchy that is nice, but for this particular application where a menu item can only be one to nine, for instance, or to five, um, it is so much easier to create a switch statement. But it's exactly the same. So over here, we switch on a particular um, variable. So it's not a Boolean in this case, it's a variable. So menu item is in this case an integer, and it has particular values that it can take. And then between the curly braces that follow, we have different case statements over here. And these case statements are being jumped to. That's how you really should think about it. So if menu item is five, then we immediately jump to case five and then execute everything that comes after this until a break statement is met. And then we jump out to the end of the curly braces. Um, and this is sometimes, if you're not used to uh, a switch statement um, or old fashion, more old-fashioned uh, programming language, a little bit uh, surprising and also could lead to problems. Because if you would forget the break statement, then it would keep on executing all the other statements that are coming at, for the next cases. So in this case, if three or four is the case, so if the menu item is three or four and then we want to do something, we want to do the exactly the same thing. In this case, we can implement this as this particular thing over here. So if menu item is three, then nothing happens over here, but there are quite a few statements over here that also belong to case four. So in that case, for both three and four, whatever is here, those three dots, is being executed until we see this break. Or in other words, there is no break statement over here, and that means that C++ keeps on executing everything it sees until it sees that break statement, even if there are multiple other cases being met. And that's sometimes a little bit um, confusing, 
But once you learn how to use, or once you've used it a couple of times, I think you'll, you'll see um, that it's really not that, that hard. And you can also have a default setting. Usually that makes sense because an integer can have so many different values, it would be impossible to cater for all of them. So in that case, you say for the couple of values that really matter, what, what happens, and for all the other values, you have then this default state. Right, then, it, then it does, and it will be the same as going into this state over here. Another thing that um, I'm sure you're already aware of is that there are loops. This is one of the basic uh, uh, parts of uh, any programming language. Um, you have while loop, you have the do while loop, they're almost the same. Um, and the, the important thing is once you have a, a, a do while loop, you go through this loop at least once. Whereas for a while loop, you can already exit right over here. And there's no guarantee that you execute this uh, at all. Right? That's the difference between the, the while loop and the do while loop. But if you're used to programming, then you can read this, right? i and some are integers, some is 0, i is 1. And as long as i is smaller than 7, we execute what is following. So sum then becomes sum plus i, i is i plus 1. And then we test whether i is still uh, smaller than 7, and do this again and again and again. So this will result in this output over here, if I didn't make a mistake. Whereas this over here immediately starts uh, saying the sum should be sum plus i, and then we, uh, i is i plus 1. And then we look whether i is still smaller than 7. And then we repeat this again and again and again. So this while loop or the do while loop are slightly different and they tend to be used in different cases. The thing that you probably all know as well is that there's this other loop, the for loop, which is uh, most used because in most of the cases when you're using a loop, you already know how many times you want to repeat something. And when you do this, a for loop is usually the best option. It is a little bit more complicated in its, uh, in its form and shape, but if you know things like Java or C, then this is nothing new. You basically have um, three parts of a for loop. The first one is an initialization statement, and it's a statement. You basically, you can, cr you can create anything here, but uh, uh, it just needs to be a statement. Then you have the stopping condition, and then you have the a statement that increments a variable. Typically, it doesn't have to be, but you could, and usually should. Uh, and this is the typical way we can, for instance, iterate uh, through a variable. It gets first the variable 0. We already, it, we already have it here. But since this is a statement, we could also immediately uh, declare our variable in uh, i here, over here, and then set it to 0, or initialize it to 0. And then as long as i is smaller or equal to 10, we keep on repeating what is then between the curly braces that are following. And then each time you execute the curly braces block, you then say i equals i plus 1, or you increment the value of i. And that way you can go through a loop and basically um, have then the sum incremented as, in, as before. All right. So just to keep this very short, there are three types of, um, uh, of loops, a for loop, a while loop, and a do while loop, and they each have their own typical usage patterns. All right. Now I want to quickly uh, get some feedback. Is this too fast? Some people are, are nodding. Some people are saying no. Okay. Um, who already? Uh, who for whom was most of this content? Like I would say, fifty percent of the content was unknown up until now. Okay. That means everybody already saw at least Java, C or C or C++, right? That's more or less what it means. Um, um, and that, that I hope uh, uh, will then be helpful for the, the coming slides. Now here are a couple more examples. These are, are examples uh, that I also hope you will do, but these are, again, not going to be checked by us. So these are examples that will be in the vein of the in-class assignment that we'll have next week. So next week, we will have an exercise session. Today, we won't. So at 2 o'clock, we will hand out papers. And you will get all different papers, you know, different assignments. And those assignments will be about three peppers. So about the difficulty level of this thing over here. And this is basically 
uh, then grade it afterwards and put into Moodle so you get feedback on your assignment afterwards. Okay, so that is how we're going to do it at least four times in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks, in the next six to seven weeks. All right? And that is, that is basically how you'll get your, um, uh, most of your grades for the exercises. I'm not entirely sure yet whether the last assignment it will be slightly different, where it's going to be a little bit more about getting or generating uh, larger classes, but uh, because that would make a lot of sense, I think, in a, for an advanced C++ course. Um, but that is uh, what the plan is. Right, and uh, this way you basically have then different options that you can train for. So this would be, for instance, also one possibility. People that uh, followed uh, Introduction to C++ probably already know this one. Um, so but this is a nice way to see whether you can really deal with loops. Uh, in this case, nested loops, because you need at least two, four loops that hook into each other in this case to be able to perform this particular assignment. It is just eight examples, so this is a slightly more difficult if you want to uh, practice a little bit more. But if you can do these, then I think um, then you're set for next, the next uh, class next week. Somebody had a question? Yes? When you do the exercise uh, next week or kind of this exercise, uh, we have to hand it in at the end of the exercise. Right? Yes, so exactly. Exactly. So, so basically, I mean, I assume that nobody wants to now start making these and then needs help from me. That's what I hope, at least. If they do, they, you can always send me an email for this first week. But, I mean, since this is all still very basic, but from next week on, it will start getting quicker. You know, you saw the schedule, and I think you will see that there is lots more new things, not just a new spaceship operator here or an auto keyword there, in that case, and then the speed will pick up as well. So I want to make sure that uh, everyone is up to speed. So uh, what you would need to do is indeed there is this, uh, eight examples. I can also, or I can also go into um, the GitHub repository. So basically, if you go to the assignment set over there, um, well, you can't you can't see this very well. Oops, you can't see this very well either. So you basically have your eight examples from the slides. So, I, so my suggestion to you is do all of those, and then you have the best preparation for the in-class assignment next week, which is the one on paper, where you have to give the paper afterwards and we mark the paper, right? Um, which is the best, all, the best preparation for the exam in the end, because that's what we can do, and, 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 or that's the only thing we can do, basically, for testing your knowledge and expertise in C++ in the end, all right? So these are the things uh, you should uh, uh, perform. And if you can do this, then feel free to email us. Yes? So basically, the exercises are always about the lecture the week before. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And then suddenly you have to do this. No, exactly, exactly. You get one week of preparation time, and this preparation time is basically about 10 examples that you have to do yourself of a variable uh, difficulty rating. And once you can do these, you, you're prepared. And we, we hope, and again, we would like feedback there afterwards or straight away even, if these are too difficult or too easy. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter if you say, oh, I probably will be uh, 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 bickering too much, but it is too easy, don't worry about it. Just send us an email with your feedback, because that only that way we can kind of know how much uh, we need to adjust. However, you know, know that this is an advanced C++ programming class, so if you would have a problem with a for loop, that would be perhaps an indicator that um, this is not a class for you, I have to say then also. Unlike my introductory classes, there I try to take everyone or drag along everyone uh, um, during the semester. Here, it is really about you know, a bit more advanced stuff. And this, I think, should definitely be not taking you too long. It's the sheer amount of them that probably takes you a bit. But I think in two hours, you can definitely do these, uh, these exercises. OK? Any other questions? Yes? Are the assignments always uh, on paper or 
Uh, yeah, that, that, so basically what I just said is actually going in that direction. So probably I want to do something also a bit more practical because on paper I force you to be up to scratch and know what a spaceship operator does, right? This is me forcing to you to do things and I don't like that either, but that's what we can uh, grade on easily. What we can't grade on so easily is... Um, how you can at the end, so in a few weeks, you will have to create classes that inherit from other classes, that use other classes, um, that are abstract classes, etc. Um, or to find cases where you can use multiple inheritance or under, show us that you understand a particular design pattern. That's something we want to test as well during this uh, semester, but at the end. That's also why um, the course schedule only looks for seven weeks, so that we can also introduce a couple more interesting and exciting teams at the end selected, but also we can test for that a bit more selected. So we're thinking about different options that are still possible with, I think, 88 people registered for this course. Um, we were a bit taken aback. I was hoping for 10. <laughs> um, but um, and with 10 people, you can do different things, but with 88 people, you need to do other things. Right? My week only has so many hours. Um, so there will be another uh, assignment at the end, but the, f the assignments for the first seven weeks will be exactly like I just told you. I will lecture, I will give you preparation examples like these, which I hope you will all do and perform. Once you do, you will then come next week and will be able to get all points in um, filling in your paper. Yeah. And the mark of the course is as we wrote on the slides, 50 -50 between the test and exactly. the assignment. Exactly. And the assignments are not prerequisite for the assignment. No, exactly. Okay. So even if you totally flunk the uh, assignments, <laughs> you could still get 50%, okay. theoretically. But, you know, probability theory plus also my experiences otherwise. <laughs> All right. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Will the exercises be like in a test environment so we are not allowed to talk to somebody or to have our block with notes on it? Yeah, so the assignment, yes. There we assume that everybody's quiet. You can sit like this, basically, each to their own paper. And you can't talk to people because you will all have different slide, slightly different uh, um, assignments to yourself anyway. So that will be the case. So we are strictly not allowed to talk. Not, not just about the I would say no, <laughs> unless you need to. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it depends. I mean, you, I mean, we can't forbid you to talk, uh, but it would be good if you wouldn't. Yes. All right. Then thank you, everyone, for coming by, and see you next week.